6640. Your future lies in 6640. 66 books by 40 authors, and yet we now discover it's an integrated message system from outside our time domain. Welcome to 6640, the ministry outreach of Koinonia House and Koinonia Institute. Today's Bible teacher is Chuck Missler, connecting the Bible to your life and the world around you. In today's study, Chuck continues his teaching on the book of Isaiah with a session titled, The Physics of Immortality. To continue another example, if I had a computer up here on the platform, and if you knew every circuit, every technology, every recording head, every magnetic and, and uh, transistor, microcircuit, all, all the technologies involved, could you predict the behavior of that computer? No, because you'd need to know what software is. The, the analogy is if you knew all the circuits in your TV set, you don't know what program's playing. The computer's a better analogy because it's an infinite state machine, and so are you. See, the thing is, the real you is software, not hardware. It is temporarily resident in hardware we call a body. That has a very profound implication. You see, this software on this disk has no mass. Its embodiment in any one instant has mass. That means the software has no time domain. That means you, sitting out there, also are independent of any dimension of time. Your physical body is in the time domain. It's physical. But the real you is not physical. The real you, call it soul, spirit, whatever, is software, not hardware. It has no time. The real you is eternal, whether you're saved or not. The question is, where will you spend that eternity? Now, I had an interesting experience that I love to make reference to. I, I travel a lot, and I obviously have to write a lot, so I'm very dependent upon a portable computer, a laptop. And I had a, uh, a, a classic laptop for many, many years that finally died. I mean, it finally didn't boot up. Had it in the shop, I think, three different times. It, it was just finally, uh, it gave up the, the years of abuse that it was subject to. And some dear friends, uh, supporters of his ministry, uh, recognizing uh, my dilemma uh, and uh, my dependence on such a tool, were gracious enough to treat me to a top-of-the-line laptop uh, some months ago. It was an interesting experience because I unwrapped this brand new uh, laptop. I took my software, collected over almost 20 years of, of teaching and tools that I use and all sorts of things, and loaded it in this new computer. And although it worked in recognizable fashion, it was very different. First of all, it worked much faster. It was in color. There were features and things that uh, I never could do before because of the environment it was in. Same software, new hardware. Every time I use that, I'm reminded that you and I are heading for an upgrade. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Frank J. Tipler. He's professor of mathematical physics at Tulane University. If you've taken an advanced course in semiconductors at, at, at the graduate level, you may have used one of his textbooks. He's a very well-known expert, a but a specialist primarily in the area of global relativity. It's a rarefied branch of physics that's populated by people like Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose and people of that caliber. He's in that league. He uh, took upon himself to try to devise an unusual mathematical model. Most cosmologists deal with what they know about physics from what they, can, they call the Big Bang to the present day. They also, the same physicists, will talk about the ultimate heat death of the universe. The universe eventually will burn out, and they, whether it's millions away, whenever it is, but it's a long way away. He decided that no one had really attacked trying to put a composite model together from the Big Bang to the end. So he decided to undertake that. That requires great expertise in, uh, in mathematics, in uh, not only global relativity, but also particle physics, and also the information sciences. It happens that Tipler is quite skilled in all of those areas. Well, as he started to pull this together, here's a guy who's a professed atheist. As he undertook this composite model, he made two discoveries. 
The first one, using the most advanced, sophisticated methods of modern physics and relying on the rigorous techniques of, uh, and procedures of logic that science demands, he discovered what he regards as a proof of the existence of God. Now, most of us in this audience say, well, gee, no kidding. What has he discovered? You know, but that's, from his approach, that's, not, that's a non-trivial, interesting thing to see happen. But secondly, this one may surprise you. He also has discovered, from the laws of physics and mathematics alone, he's concluded that every human being that's ever been walked on the earth is destined for a resurrection. And that may surprise you. He's published a book called The Physics of Immortality. And he believes, he, he claims that he arrived at these conclusions this, about God and immortality in exactly the same way that physicists calculate the properties of an electron. He believes that the central claims of Judeo-Christian theology are in fact true, and that these uh, uh, claims are straightforward deductions from the laws of physics as we now understand them. Now, I don't misunderstand. I'm not going to. I'm not suggesting you run out and buy his book. There's a lot of it that I wouldn't agree with, and uh, you have to have a real appetite for differential equations, etc., if you want to enjoy that. But I do think that these conclusions from a professed atheist are rather interesting. If you're interested in this area, you can learn a lot more from simply reading the most important chapter of the Bible. Now, what is the most important chapter of the Bible? There are many candidates, but I think one can easily support 1 Corinthians 15 as such a chapter. It's the centerpiece of Christianity, and it faces the ultimate enemy of mankind, death. So I invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. We won't have the time to go through it thoroughly. I hope I can whet your appetite enough that you'll commit yourself to making a serious study of the chapter. We have a commentary on, on uh, 1 Corinthians that uh, I encourage you to explore if, if I can simulate interest here. But the next question I want to ask you that relates to all of this, if, if, how many of you have heard the term the gospel? Excuse your hands? Well, that's pretty good. That's about 80%. That's not bad. You all heard the term gospel. What is the gospel? Good news, great. What does that mean? What is the gospel? The answer happens to be in the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 15. Paul defines the gospel. And it may shock you to realize that this is not to be taken for granted. It may shock you to realize that there are major denominations on the planet Earth, Christian, call themselves Christian, that deny these verses. I don't want to get into that kind of controversy here. Just be sensitive to the fact that what we're dealing with here is not obvious and yet fundamental. Without this, we have no redemption. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Paul saying, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and which ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. One disturbing thing so far is that you can't believe in vain. Ooh, you want to investigate what that means, but let's move on. Paul continues, verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, that... Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Period. He goes on to some of the things we'll come to. You know what's interesting about this is what Paul did not mention. He never made reference to the Lord's teachings. Didn't make reference to his miracles. He didn't make reference to his example. Now, there's good lessons in all of those. It's all very important, but they're not what Paul is calling the gospel. What is the gospel? These three elements. One, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. First of all, that he died. He didn't just disappear. The 12th Imam of Islam disappeared. Occulted, as they say. They're expecting him to come back. That's their deliverer that there's an expectancy for no, Christ died. He didn't just die. He died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He died fulfilling a very specific procedure outlined in the Torah for the remission of sins. He died for you and I. It's staggering to go across the country and inventory different groups and cults and, and denominations that claim that they're Christians but the deny that Christ died once and for all completely for our sins, according to the scriptures. Colonel idea, key idea. 
Second thing, that he was buried. It's interesting that only Paul emphasizes this. And he later in the chapter links this to baptism, in which we partake of an identification with that, where we are buried and then brought up again. He was buried. It's interesting how the authorities of that day made sure that his death was undeniable. And further, they uh, outwitted themselves because they took so many precautions to make sure that Jesus was dead and remained in the grave that they thus documented the miracle for us. Hmm. His burial. There's a pattern here we talk about in baptism, but it's something we might just remind ourselves as we explore this. If you're in Jesus Christ, if you've been truly baptized in Jesus Christ, Something in you must die. Nothing can be resurrected that hasn't died. Think about that. And then, of course, the third element of the three, he was raised. It's interesting, as they promoted the story that his body was stolen, they're documenting, in fact, that the grave was empty. There's an empty tomb. You can go visit it um, when you're in Israel. But twice in these three verses, Paul emphasizes according to the scriptures. It's interesting that this whole procedure is documented throughout the Old Testament. It's even hidden in the genealogy of Noah. We've talked about that many times. I won't distract ourselves right now to review it again. But from Genesis onwards, Genesis 5, the genealogy of Noah, we have this laid out. How that man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort, hidden in the meaning of the names of the ten people from Adam to Noah. And in Genesis 22, when a and Abraham is instructed to offer his son Isaac, Abraham knows he's acting out prophecy. He names the place at the end of the procedure, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Because indeed on that very spot, 2,000 years later, another father did indeed offer his son as an offering for sin. And on it goes throughout the scripture. Of course, Jonah is one example that Jesus himself points to. If you take any one of these pieces away, you have no gospel. If you take any one of these pieces away, you and I are not redeemed. You and I are in our sins and our faith is vain. There are many things in the scripture you might not really buy into, you may not understand, fine. This is the kernel. This is the dividing issue. It isn't pre-trib, post-trib. It isn't uh, uh, charismatic, non-charismatic. The issue is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, another little interesting thing. If I told you that some years ago in Dallas, Texas, President John F. Kennedy was killed with a bow and arrow. How many of you would believe me? Yeah, I got one in the back there, yeah. <laughs> when I give this talk in California, I always get nervous with those kinds of questions. You know, maybe a century from now, I might be able to fly that kind of a story, but not now. And the reason is, there's too many people around you, among you, that were eyewitnesses in one way or another of that event. Now, there were over 500 people when Jesus said, uh, when his, after his resurrection, he's going to be meet him up in Galilee. There were over 500 people that were up there. And they were alive at the time that Paul wrote this epistle somewhere among that congregation. So it wasn't an issue. Interesting testimony. See, if the Jewish or Roman authorities could have produced the body of Jesus, all the rumors, of course, would have quickly stopped and it all would have ended. But, of course, they could not. Whenever I'm in this area in the scripture, whenever Easter is approaching, I always uh, delight in sharing an insight that you won't find in your Bible. I'm indebted to Chuck Smith's own research for this anecdote. Um, you all may recall that Joseph of Arimathea... Uh, after the crucifixion, went to Pilate to take the body. Uh, we learn a lot from that incident. Uh, first of all, you need to understand both Roman and Jewish law put it upon the next of kin to take care of even a criminal that was killed. That was the, that was the law. But for um, Joseph of Arimathea to have direct access to Pilate tells you is very wealthy and very influential because you don't just go up to the Roman proc uh, procurator. But he obviously had access. He also apparently was the next of kin. But what's not recorded in your scripture is Pilate's surprise because he turns to uh, Joseph Arimathea and he says, I don't understand this. You're the richest man in the area. You've got this brand new tomb for your family and you're going to give it to this criminal? 
And of course, Joseph says, Oi ve, it's just for the weekend. <laughs> I should hasten to add, uh, much of what I learned from Chuck Smith is not quite that apocryphal, but I can't resist sharing that story with you. It is interesting that after his crucifixion, Jesus is handled only by loving hands. And he's, on, and he's beheld only by loving eyes. Interesting. But the empty tomb demonstrates that his resurrection was physical, not some metaphorical uh, use of idiom. It was physical. And it's emphasized in all four Gospels. It's interesting to, to study his resurrection body. We know he could appear and disappear at his own will, recorded several times in the Gospels. He could move, apparently, through solid walls. It's from those uh, recordings that most advanced physicists believe that he lived in more than three dimensions, probably at least 11 or more, and I'll go into why. That's a whole specialized area of hyperspaces. But the fact that you could take a six-sided figure like, like this uh, prism in which we're in. In other words, uh, you've got four walls, a floor, and a ceiling. So you've got to contain three-dimensional space. And yet he could enter and leave that space without passing through the walls, floors, and ceilings. Interesting. Uh, you can explain that mathematically in hyperspaces. There's only two kinds of people that understand hyperspaces, advanced mathematicians and small children. But, um, and yet he wasn't a spirit. He challenges them, handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bone, not flesh and blood. Blood speaks of corruption, it was shed for sins. No, flesh and bone, he says. He could eat food. In fact, he never appeared in his resurrection body without eating. My kind of guy, I like that. But apparently it wasn't necessary. Though glorified, he could be recognized, although with some difficulty. We'll come back to that. And of course, apparently there's no more experience of death, aging, crying, mourning, sorrow, or pain, as the scripture emphasizes in a number of places. Now, what's exciting about this the reason we take so much interest in him, in this regard, we have very personal interest. We know that we will be like him in many ways. In fact, uh, uh, Philippians 3.21 is one place, but I'm going to just go, to, in the interest of time, let's go to uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. This is a verse that I think many of you have had quoted. You may have memorized it. It's a familiar, uh, uh, on, on, on a list of key verses, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. But I venture to say there's an aspect of physics here that most people miss. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, the apostle tells us, Beloved, now are we the children of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That doesn't mean a lot to you unless you had a little bit of background in hyperspaces. If I have a two-dimensional world, a plane, and I come along as a three-dimensional being and put my finger through the plane, what do the people in the two-dimensional world see? A circle. You've been through our flatland examples in the past. In other words, in a two, you, you see the projection of a three. You can only see a projection, a, a subset, if you will, of a three-dimensional space in a, in a, in a two-dimensional space. And likewise, you can expand this in higher dimensions. Well, the point is, he sa it says here, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Not a representation, not a projection, not a simulation. We shall see him as he is. What does that imply to a physicist or a mathematician is that we'll enjoy enough dimensions to see him as he really is. Wild stuff here. Wild stuff. Now, his resurrection has another dimension. It's a guarantee. One of the things the scripture points out, and Paul elaborates in 1 Corinthians as he develops this here, that uh, not only does his body transcend time and space, his body also serves as an assurance, as a guarantee of our own resurrection. And our justification as believers rests squarely on his resurrection. Because Paul talks about it as the first fruits. And if you study Leviticus 23, you know in the Feasts of Israel you had the Passover, which corresponds to his, his offering himself. But on the morning after Shabbat, after Passover, so whether he was resurrected on Wednesday or Friday, I won't get into that one here, but whatever it was, the next Shabbat and the next morning, which we would call Sunday morning, is the time that they celebrate the Feast of Firstfruits. And indeed, 
several places in Scripture, it points to Jesus Christ as our first fruits. And one way to look at that is that, it's, well, of course, it's the first sheaf of the forthcoming grain harvest. And it was uh, uh, the, uh, indicated that the harvest would be followed by the rest of the sheaves. It was, uh, it was sort of like a down payment or a guarantee or a security deposit. That was the concept behind it. And that's what his resurrection involves. Now, how many of you had anything to do with your first birth? Okay, good. Okay. You had nothing to do with it, yet you are involved in its sin. You're subject to its genetic defects passed on. You had nothing to do with your second birth. God did that. But you're involved in its deliverance, and, and you're implicated in the purity of God through that. Now, all this is testified to and assured by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It assures us of our resurrection. Now, the concept of a resurrection, Paul continues in 1 Corinthians, and I'm being bring very light here in the interest of time to get at some other points I want to make. But it's interesting. It's no harder to believe in the resurrection than it is a harvest. We plant a seed in the ground, and it brings forth grain, Right? The closer you are to the land, the more natural it all seems. It's kind of interesting. You come home from a hard day at work, and you discover on the kitchen table there are some newspapers and some of these dirty uh, bulbs sitting there. You ask your wife, uh, what are these things? You spent good money for these? Oh, those are gladiolas. Oh, come on. No, no, watch. So she takes these out in the backyard, plants them in the ground, waters them, and pretty soon it's Route comes up, and pretty soon you have glorious flowers, beautiful things from those ugly, dirty little bulbs. Two points. Not only do they come forth as a model of the resurrection, they bore very little resemblance to what was planted. Now, wild, we're heading for an upgrade. By the way, there are records, I haven't been able to verify this, but I understand there's records of wheat sprouting from seeds from ancient Egypt. They find them in these tombs and things, and apparently there's been some records where they've actually sprouted and grown. Now, whether it's true or not, I haven't really checked, but I've, I've read that in some of them. There's another example that I'm fond of using, and that's the idea, we've all played with it as kids, that's the caterpillar. How many of you played with a caterpillar when you were small? Yeah, we all have, right? Caterpillar is a strange creature. Caterpillar is... Um, for all practical purposes, he's subject to a two-dimensional existence. He wanders around. He crosses the sidewalk, hoping there are no skateboarders on the way. You know, He's a two-dimensional creature for all practical purposes. Then one day, he crawls up underneath a leaf, and he spends some effort building a crypt. Some people call it a cocoon. Crawls inside, and for all intents and purposes, is dead to the world. And then one day, of course, it breaks open and out comes a caterpillar? No. A gorgeous butterfly. Far more beautiful than the creature it replaces. And it also enjoys an additional dimension of existence. It's truly three-dimensional. It can fly. Interesting, interesting model the Lord has put before us. Now, what Paul does is, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, he, he, he continues this theme of the uh, resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. And he goes through, and I want, I'm not going to take the time here, but I, I at least want to uh, acknowledge that he hammers pretty hard on the fact that this belief, this doctrine, this view, this understanding of the resurrection is the most essential of all our Christian beliefs. It's the centerpiece of Christianity. And he goes through and builds a whole argument that if there was no resurrection, what that implies... See, if Christ was not resurrected, then we're not. And we're in our sins. And he goes through and he, and he, and he develops that, and uh, I'll let you go through that. But he then concludes this incredible chapter, lengthy chapter, on the resurrection with an allusion to an event that's pretty strange. He alludes to a mystery that was not revealed in the Old Testament, that was his privilege to reveal. The word mystery in the English is translated from the Greek word mysterion, which has a special meaning. It's something like a password. It's something that's not known till now, but I'm not even revealing it to you. A mystery is something I'm now that you didn't know, no one could have known before, now I'm telling you. That's what the term really implies, the word mysterion in the Greek. Verse 51, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound... And the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Strange event. See, there will be a time when the resurrection occurs, there's some of us that will still be alive. So Paul points out there will be some that won't sleep, that won't pass into death, as we know it, but will immediately, in an instant, be changed. Now he will expand on this more thoroughly, I should say, it's, it's more expanded on more thoroughly in 1 Thessalonians 4 and some other passages. And I, won't, I don't want to get into all that here tonight. There's some other directions I'd like to take us, but I want you to understand that tied to this concept of the resurrection of the body are those who receive the resurrection bodies directly from life as we know it. I'm, I personally don't have a, a, a lot of comfort with these little drawings and pictures that show you know, people flying off into the sky at the rapture because I don't think those are the bodies that the, body, that the scripture is talking about. What happens to the bodies that leave behind? I have no idea. All kinds of speculative conjectures. I won't indulge in those right now, but I do want you to understand that the resurrection body we're talking about is quite different. You've been listening to 6640, the ministry outreach of Koinonia House and Koinonia Institute. Today's Bible teacher was Chuck Missler, teaching through the book of Isaiah. Download the new K-House TV app to access an ever-growing collection of free resources. Visit the Apple or Android app store or search K-House TV on your Roku or Fire TV streaming device. Thank you for listening to 6640 and for your continued prayerful support of this ministry. Until next time, as we continue this series, may God bless you with the knowledge of His Son, Jesus Christ, as you study His Word.